introduction for you was in the skyscraper. I don't want to go any further because I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So without any further ado, if you are ready, we're glad to hear from you now. Great. That sounds great. Well, thanks, Steve. And uh, let's see, I need to share my screen. Well, so, um, yeah, this evening I'm talking a little bit about the, uh, the magazine, uh, the uh, hobby that I love, uh, my, my tenure in it. If I can get rid of Okay, get rid of that. And uh, um, kind of some background, but more than anything, I want to talk a little bit about uh, I, what I feel is the importance of amateur astronomy within the context of our current culture. And uh, first, I, I love, love the, the, uh, this uh, initial image here. Nothing gets me more excited than a large telescope out on an observing field getting ready to do a, a night of observing. So um, anyway, to give a little bit of background on the magazine, um, this magazine was started uh, uh, back about 27 years ago by Tom Clark. And uh, Tom Clark uh, was a, uh, an observer and also produced Tektron Telescopes, telescope maker. And at that time, two of his favorite magazines um, were a, a Deep Sky and Telescope Making. And both of them stopped publishing both, both about the same time in 1993. Uh, Deep Sky was published by uh, David Eicher, current uh, editor of Astronomy Magazine, the telescope making. Um, it was by a former uh, editor of, uh, of Astronomy Magazine. Um, and so uh, when they stopped publishing, Tom was waiting for somebody to pick up the, uh, the pieces there, and nobody did. So he started um, and uh, came out with Amateur Astronomy Magazine. And if you notice the cover, it looks a lot like those other magazines. It was heavily influenced by it. Uh, it was a whopping 34 pages with three pages of ads. And he was able to convince some of the writers of those two other uh, publications to come over and, and uh, publish for him. And so that's how he started off uh, very, uh, like I say, his first uh, first publication and got off and going. But he covered the two things that he loved, which was observing, telescope making, and uh, also some star parties. Well, I took over the uh, magazine uh, now, gosh, what was it, uh, 15, uh, 15 years ago. And first thing that I did was I digitized the, uh, the magazine, one, so I could distribute it uh, more affordably to people overseas and outside the United States. Uh, but I also worked out a, a uh, um, arrangement with Tom Clark so I could digitize his first uh, 54 um, issues, quarterly issues, and produced a, a complete anthology of the magazine at that time on DVD. And from there, we've continued with a dual publication. We still publish in print on uh, high quality glossy paper and also have a digital version in full color for people who want it that way and want it distributed. And some people choose to get both. Um, there's a certain benefits of both, but the, I really still like to hold the publication in my hand as do a lot of people. So we plan on continuing that as long as is, is possible. We also continue to cover everything that uh, amateur astronomers are engaged in uh, from still some telescope making um, observing, imaging, uh, spectroscopy, photometry, um, observatory construction, remote uh, um, uh, observing uh, or imaging, and uh, pretty much, again, I still cover star parties, um, a little bit on equipment reviews. In short, just about everything that amateur astronomers are engaged in. And uh, as you probably recognize this, uh, you all, you, I know a lot of you uh, visited me, and since we're kind of a niche within a niche, since we're geared towards an active astronomer, not just the armchair astronomer, um, I try and get out there and get the GERD word out to uh, spread the, uh, the news about the magazine and uh, continue to expand our, our uh, uh, subscription base. And NEEF is a great place to do that. I hope it comes back next year. I've missed it for the last couple. Um, but when you're out there with the public, you have uh, 
engagements, which are always interesting. And I've learned to uh, deal with uh, the critics with a grain of salt. And sometimes the critics can be your best friend if you uh, can get your ego out of the way. Sometimes they give you good advice that will make the publication e even better. Uh, but I remember one instance which was quite unusual. And uh, it was on a Sunday, which is a quieter day at Neve. And I saw this gentleman look, look at me rather intently and started marching towards me with his head about a foot in front of his body. Uh, pretty intense. Anyway, so I, 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 I happened to be doing a skit that year with some of the other vendors. And so I went down and grabbed my Star Wars helmet, put it on my head, figured it would lighten the mood, if nothing else, like, you know, deflect a head blow. And um, this guy marched over and he said, I hate I hate the name of your magazine. Now, I, I've had people hate the magazine or hate a number of things about it, but the name, and it seemed rather strange, particularly in a venue which is geared towards amateur astronomy. So I looked back, uh, feeling it was safe. I wasn't going to get the head blow, took off my helmet to engage with them a little bit more and said, what exactly is it you don't like about the name of my magazine? It's amateur astronomy. And he said, I hate the name amateur. I mean, amateurs are engaged in all kinds of things that use the word amateur, uh, in all kinds of serious science, and they contribute all these different things, and they're measuring the work that they do with variable stars, and he listed this whole host of things that he had been doing, all of which I was nodding my head, yeah, we, we cover all that stuff, that's good stuff. And then he said, so that's why I hate the name amateur, and so I just said, well, let me ask you, is anybody paying you for your... Uh, astronomy pursuits <laughs> and he just looked at me and turned around and, and walked off so I guess he was a little hacked off because nobody was paying him but at the end of the day we're called amateur astronomy because most of us are engaged not for profit uh, but because of our love of science and astronomy um, although it does it does remind me of a time I, I uh, spent with uh, this man Rob McNaught who is a, uh, a famous comet hunter and I was down at Siding Springs, Australia. And uh, I asked Rob, I said, hey, can I hang out with you and watch you search for comets, which is a kind of a neat opportunity and really nice guy I said, absolutely. Well, uh, the first thing I learned was that uh, searching for comets has, has uh, a lot of rugby watching attached to it when it comes to rugby, McNaught. I guess there were some scrimmages or something like that. So anyway, there was a lot of rugby going on, but we got in great conversations and I watched him do his thing where he blinks different plates and he goes back and does comparisons. And actually there was one that he, I think a minor comet that he discovered that night. Um, but he also told me he was going on vacation. And I asked him, are, you know, are you gonna do anything astronomy related? He said, no, no, just having fun doing some different things. And uh, uh, that led me to say, hey, do you, do you miss being an amateur astronomer? You know, going out and just doing it for fun. And he thought about it for a minute and he says, no, I, I think that it's better to be paid to search for comets rather than not being paid to search for comets. And it's hard to ar argue with that. So. Uh, some people who are engaged in, in uh, actual professional pay in the hobby still are engaged in what I would call amateur astronomy. So to tell you a little bit about my uh, background, and uh, this, this, uh, this uh, image I shot down at the Winter Star Party at about uh, 2.30 in the morning as the moon was rising just underneath the Milky Way. And warm top tropical skies have a lot to do with uh, how I got engaged in this hobby as a, as a young boy. Um, I had the good fortune of, of living on a boat in Miami, Florida, rather unusual um, a childhood for most people. And uh, my father was a teacher. And uh, so in the summer months, uh, we'd cast off the lines and we'd go cruising in the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands. Well, back then there was no such thing as, as GPS. And so we used a sextant, uh, sextant uh, ship's compass, ship's chronometer, and charts to uh, chart our course. And um, so that was my first introduction to celestial mechanics, but also very dark skies as we were out in these uh, uh, uninhabited islands uh, in, in the Bahamas. And uh, it left me with a love of one uh, instruments and really nice charts to this day, even with all the digital resources, I love my star charts and I have shelves full of them. Um, but when we were down there at night, there was nothing to do. We didn't have generators. This was you know, back in the day where the sun went down and so did you. We'd do a little bit of reading 
And then uh, we'd look up at the at the beautiful night sky, and it was absolutely gorgeous down there. Like I say, long ways from any light source. Uh, so it's exposed to some really, really beautiful dark skies uh, as a young man. And my mom would point out the constellations she remembered from an astronomy course in college, and dad would uh, uh, relay the uh, um, mythology behind it, which I, I think he expanded it on quite a bit in order for just for general entertainment purposes. Uh, but in general, the night sky became our evening entertainment. And uh, that carried with me a bit. But uh, like, like everybody else, kind of life gets in the way and you get caught up in a number of other things. So we we're, were a number of years um, until I got engaged again in amateur astronomy. And interestingly, the same year that uh, Amateur Astronomy Magazine began uh, publishing, 1994, was the same year I got a serious telescope as, as an adult. Um, but it was a, a while after that that I really, uh, that I got exposed to uh, those same dark skies that I saw as a child. And that was when I was living in Dallas. Um, I was a director for a Brinks Home Security at the time. And I got involved in the uh, Dallas-Fort uh, Worth uh, astronomy clubs, actually both of them, and they were great clubs. And uh, uh, somebody invited me, said, you've got to come out to the Texas Star Party. So in the year 2000, I attended my first star party, uh, dark sky star, star party, and they were phenomenal skies uh, that year. And it was, I had come to, to know the night sky fairly well, but I had not been exposed to skies this dark since I was a kid. And so I literally had to squint my eyes in order to cut out all the, all the extra noise of all these stars in order to see the constellations that I recognized and point my telescope. Um, so it was a wonderful experience and it kind of got me fired up. And it was the following year that somebody invited me to observe on the 82 inch McDonald Observatory scope. And it is a, a phenomenal visual instrument if you ever get the opportunity to. So one of the members of the Dallas Club called me and said, uh, hey, Charlie, we're going to get together 12 people to rent the McDonald Observatory scope for the entire evening. And uh, it was a dark sky, very unusual to get the opportunity for a full, full evening on this scope. And we get to make our own lists, and we have an astronomer who's going to point it for us. So um, obviously, I didn't even have to check my calendar. I, I uh, committed to it and was happy happy to do it. And uh, oddly, it, it, uh, the the cost for that evening was one hundred dollars, which which goes down is the best one hundred dollars I've ever spent in my life. Um, so I had a great time um, uh, observing uh, through this telescope, and it represents also the uh, first article that I wrote for Amateur Astronomy Magazine for Tom Clark. And it was absolutely phenomenal. But after that experience, um, there was no turning back. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it left me with this uh, disorder, um, uh, obsessive amateur astronomy disorder, OAAD, which seems to be uh, intensified every time I spend additional time under dark night skies. And so I, I think some of you may be affected by this as well. So I'll add Jeff Foxworthy. I, I thought I'd share a few of the uh, telltale signs of, uh, that you may have OAAD as well. So uh, first, if you think that $20,000 is an outrageous sum to remodel your kitchen, but a reasonable amount for your next telescope purchase, you definitely have, have some of the symptoms. So if, if you drive something like this on the left in order during the day, in order that you can drive something like that on the right, you definitely have OAAD. And uh, if you, you think your idea of a great vacation is to hang out on a remote field, uh, limited creature comforts, and a bunch of other like-minded people in the heat or the cold and being eaten alive by bugs, and, and you don't mind eating and sleeping in close proximity to a portalette, you, you definitely have OAAD, so. And uh, you walk around your house with a patch over your eye looking like a pirate in order to preserve for your dark adaption with your observing eye um, on new moon nights, definite symptom. And you, you have more eye pieces than your spouse has shoes or you have shoes. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I got this picture of uh, uh, Miss Aguilera. And if you notice in the background uh, on the mannequin there, she's got an eye patch. So I think possibly she's a closet amateur astronomer. 
So now this was an actual, these were uh, taken at the same time, a friend of mine, Bill Williams, and he built a house in Chief Astronomy Village. And I took a picture of his house, which as you can see is vacant. His, his son had to set up a folding chair. And on the right, you can see his warm room for his, the control room for his observatory. So you can see where his priorities were. <laughs> And uh, if your backyard looks something like this, but all you can talk about is your latest project, which is your nitrogen purge cooling system on your imaging amount, which something looks something like that, you definitely have your priorities uh, it, it, it aligned with OAAD. You look at the forecast and you see these little, you know, icons of the sun and clear skies, and it makes you deliriously happy. But when you see those little clouds, you you lapse into depression. This is definitely OAAD stuff. So, um, your family, your friends, your work associates, everyone who knows you have nicknames for you like star guy, space geek, space man, you name it, star freak. Uh, then you definitely have ha have a tad of this as well. And you know, your family's work associates, in fact, everybody that knows you all have nicknames for you similar to Mooney, Moon Child, Moon Man, but it has nothing to do with either of these activities. Yeah, o OAAD. So, well, there's no question that that uh, we are different than the average public. Um, we speak a different language. Uh, it was interesting. They did a poll recently that I, I thought was absolutely shocking. And one in four people was still a little confused as to whether the uh, uh, the sun traveled around the earth or the earth traveled around the sun. I thought that was settled a long time ago, but 25% of the population seems like an astounding amount. And I actually heard on a talk show, two somewhat educated guests discussing whether the moon was a star or a planet. So even if you have rudimentary knowledge of amateur astronomy, um, you, you are in a, in a little different group than the average public. And um, I, I, I tell you, I've, I know that uh, some of you have had this confusion, and this is interesting because this came from my publisher, the, the person who publishes my magazine. And you can see up in the top, Insight Notice Job Created, 2019 Amateur Astrology. Oh, so no, I didn't branch out into another. Uh, people seem to get that confused all the time, and I'm sure people have introduced you like they have me. Hey, Charlie has an intense interest in astrology. And, uh, you know, I look at what's well, even worse in my case when they say, hey, Charlie publishes an astrology publication. Well, that takes a really special kind of person. And so you see the person withdraw their hand as they were going to shake your hand, afraid you're going to do a palm reading or something. And it's just a difficult social situation to back yourself out of. On the one hand, like I say, they're they're not sure if you're, you're, you're going to do a seance or uh, on the other, they, you know, they respond and say, hey, so am I, you know, what's your sign? And that's where I have to delicately become an ambassador for amateur astronomy and say, you know, um, hey, I have an interest in planetary movement as well, um, but I direct myself more towards physics and self-determination. And uh, but, but we do have some common ground there when it comes to planetary motion and that you ever uh, looked into astronomy. Um, Anyway, there is this confusion. There definitely, we speak a different language and it comes up frequently and uh, people really don't know exactly what it is that we do. Um, I, I found this meme and I thought it was fairly appropriate. You know, our, my friends sometimes think uh, what we see through our telescopes is akin to something they, they see from those Hubble photos. My family actually has asked me, have I seen some of those exoplanets that they're discovering that they read about? Of course, my, my neighbors think this is what I do with my telescopes based on their high opinion of me. And uh, professionals think we see precisely nothing, you know. Sometimes my inverted imagination has me thinking I see more than I do. But what we really see is pretty fascinating, uh, particularly when we engage our, our mind in the activity. Uh, but the other, the other thing that I think comes up, which is uh, rather interesting, is uh, people always talk about what they did on their vacation or what are you going to do on your vacation? Well, I got uh, this next theme uh, and my friends think that what I do is something between uh, uh, Nostradamus and, and uh, Copernicus, I think. Uh, they haven't quite figured out exactly what it is. My family thinks I do more of the party with the star party and uh, I must say I have some friends that probably lend to that conclusion. Uh, my neighbors, based on their high opinion of me, think it's some cultish thing. 
professionals think we play with their little toys. I, you know, imagine myself with our big scope doing our uh, important things. And, but what we really do is hang out on a field with like-minded individuals, enjoy the night sky, and get to compare notes about what we're doing, what we're observing, uh, and the instruments that, that we're using. Um, but again, there's no question there is a difference. I, and um, I frequently wonder, you know, why, you know, we know that there are lots of tel telescopes being sold. And it's frequently when I, when I query somebody who's a new subscriber, um, they started out like I did with some little TASCO telescope on wobbly legs. Um, so what's the difference between the person who looks through a telescope a couple of times and gets fed up with it and the other person who relegates it to the hall closet until it's sold at some garage sale in the near future? Um, you know, why does somebody look through a telescope and just see a gray smudge and somebody else sees, you know, photons that are coming from galaxies that are, um, you know, hundreds or millions of light years away and, and hold the mysteries to the universe? Um, and I think there's some common ground in that, um, and it has to do with just a general interest in uh, the natural sciences um, and inquisitive nature. And uh, we have a feature that I enjoyed. It's been go uh, it, we started to start people with issue number one, and we've continued it this day, and it explores that uh, kind of how did these people? How did you get engaged in the hobby? What was it that that captured your interest? And where did you go from there? And so we we continue it again. Still one of my favorite features and, that I love. But there are some common grounds in these folks who um, delve in more deeply. And for me, it, it had to do not just with a pot. I mean, like like me, a lot of these people had some positive experience, and it may have been just someone uh, sharing a view of of. Uh, uh, you know, craters on the moon or the rings of Saturn um, to ignite that initial flame. But I think it goes beyond that. And most of the people had somebody in their life who was some kind of a mentor that moved him in the right direction. And, and for me, um, one of my earliest mentors uh, was my grandmother, this, this woman. She was a Juilliard trained concert harpist uh, turned educator. And uh, grandmother was a very serious woman and she was educated by vocation and avocation. She loved it and she tried to turn every experience into a learning experience. And there are very few things that I remember when I was eight years old, but I do remember very specifically a conversation uh, my grandmother had with me. Um, I was uh, misbehaving, which wasn't unusual for me at, at eight years old. Uh, I, I, I believe I was uh, tempted to spearfish the barbecue fork in her goldfish bowl, so um, not a good thing. Uh, so grandmother came up to me and, and fearing for my life, um, my lame excuse was, grandmother, I'm bored. And grandmother looked at me, she grabbed my chin, she looked me in the eye and she says, boredom is for people who are unintelligent, uninspired or uninteresting. And she said, Charles, you are none of those things. And she grabbed me by the hand and she said, just down the hall is a library full of books of some of the greatest minds who've ever walked the face of the earth. And outside is, uh, is a world of nature that can hold your attention for 10 lifetimes. And so she uh, grabbed my hand and she says, let's go outside and discover something. And so she led me out and she started to relate uh, some of the botanical names of plants and uh, showed me different trees and walked down the walk to the seashore and along there. And she picked up uh, shells and told me about the prehistoric uh, um, history of a horseshoe crab we found. Um, but she didn't just tell me things. She asked me questions and she said, Charles, what, what, do you, what do you think this is? What do you think it might be related to? Why do you think these two things might be similar? And so she, she continued to, to query me and get me to begin to think critically. And um, she encouraged me to ask lots of questions. And at eight years old, you can ask lots of questions. And she would answer some and sometimes I'd stump her. And when I did, she would take me back up to the library and we would look up various resources and we would try and discover the answers. And um, that library and those nature walks became some of my favorite experiences. Um, she had a real library with one of those rolling ladders and, and incredible um, leather bound uh, uh, tomes. 
and just I, I, and resources that uh, covered about every area that you could imagine. And uh, she did. She introduced me to some of the greatest minds that had ever lived on the face of the earth, starting them at an early age. And uh, we took many, many more discovery nature walks. But needless to say, I never told my grandmother again that I was bored and, and I didn't have to. She introduced me to reading and um, it started me on a course um, of self-education, which is really what she was teaching me. I mean, again, she believed in formal education, uh, but she didn't think it should stop there. And um, so I developed a habit probably the last three decades of uh, setting a goal to read at least uh, 50, 50 books a year and on a variety of disciplines. And during that time, I came across this, uh, this book, A More Beautiful Question, The Power of Inquiring to Spark Breakthrough, I Breakthrough Ideas by Warren Berger. And I just recently reread it. And even though it has nothing to do with astronomy or science, it has everything to do with the motivation and what I feel the, the, the key ideas uh, behind it and motivating it. And uh, this quote was so what really um, framed this more beautiful question. And it's a quote by E.E. E. Cummings. It's the very last verse of his uh, um, book, uh, simply entitled Poems. It's uh, always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. That's rather an unusual, but not unusual for E. Cummings. He likes to twist the English language a little bit to make you think about things. And he in interjects this, uh, this pronoun, which makes you wonder, is it the answer? Who is the who? Uh, the answer, the question, the, the questioner. And uh, it leads you to what Warren Berger expounds on and what my grandmother knew. And that is the questions you ask begin to define who you are and help you develop a sense of your place in, in all of this. And so uh, the ability to question and think critically is absolutely essential. And, and I fear it's something that's being lost with our current education. Um, the Warren Berger went on, obviously not every question is what he would call a beautiful question. He said a beautiful question is an ambitious and yet actionable question that can begin to shift the way we perceive or think about something. Uh, so think about that. That's, so it's, a, it's something that we have to be able to take action on, uh, but it can literally lead to a paradigm shift or a shift in the way we see everything and change the way we view ourselves and the world around us. Um, and, it's, and there's nothing new about that. You know, Aristotle, uh, uh, those who wish to succeed must ask the right preliminary questions. I mean, it was the beginning of philosophy and philosophical thought. This whole idea about questioning and asking questions that direct our thoughts and begin to uh, help us critically assess things. Anyway, the, my, my grandmother understood this, and I didn't understand that's where she was leading me at the time. But as I read this book, I realized wow, she was right on target with what she was doing. And she literally put me on a different path because of that. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, after that experience, about five years later, I lost my grandmother, but not, not before we uh, got to do a number of uh, additional discovery walks and spent a lot of time in her, in her library. And I, I'm sure some of you out there are, are uh, grandparents, I would say, don't underestimate the impact you can have on your grandchildren. Anyway, this whole um, beautiful question and these queries to me are, are absolutely what our hobby is about. And you can take a look at this object, uh, the Crab Nebula and uh, M1. And it just begs the question, I mean, where did it come from? Well, it was a supernova recorded in 1054. And those questions can lead you to other questions about how they recorded history or the Chinese recorded uh, these events, which were uh, really detailed, especially for that time. But you also can find out that they recorded these events, even some of the uh, Native Americans in pictographs. And so this was a big deal, the supernova where the star was visible in the night sky. But then you dig into it and you find out, gosh, this thing is, actually has a pulsar. Well, what's a pulsar? What's synchrotron radiation? And each question that you ask leads to more beautiful questions and a deeper understanding of 
the physics behind it and the natural world. And so there have been entire symposiums that have been conducted on this one object, this uh, Messier 1, the Crab Nebula. And it's absolutely fascinating. It radiates in almost every part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We had one gentleman who wanted to try, see if with amateur equipment, he could record uh, the pulsar using, um, uh, using a, a phased lens. And so it's just fascinating what you could delve into and the questions you can ask. And each one of those questions leads to a further question. And uh, this object, obviously, M82, and you see this outgassing. This is a long exposure by my friend Tony Hallis. And uh, you study this, and again, it's one thing to see it or to image it. It's a beautiful image, but what is that? And uh, we find out it's an active galaxy, and, and active galaxies are pretty special. They have this huge amount of star-forming regions within them. And this outgassing is a result of interaction with a nearby neighbor and leads to other beautiful questions about gosh, M81 and how did they interact? How are they interact? Did they actually collide? And you find out a little bit more uh, about tidal interactions, uh, gravity waves, and it leads to a whole host of additional questions. And uh, of course, that leads us to ask also, do we have some of these, are, are we an active galaxy? No, we have actually very few active regions in our native galaxy, but we have one that we're mo probably most f familiar with and uh, in the Ryan Nebula, at the very center of the Ryan Nebula. And with a large scope, you can drill down inside to the trapezium and see those areas where there are protostars being formed. And I took this image with some narrow band um, uh, uh, filters on there. And it was fascinating as I asked questions. Well, I, 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 and I asked questions and I answered them myself with actionable uh, and uh, with uh, direct actions. And I, so I took a, an image, long exposure image with my ionized oxygen and then ionized hydrogen, ionized nitrogen and sulfur. And I could look at each one of these band waves and it made you ask additional questions and um, study in what's happening here. And you have this intense radiation, which is ripping the, the electrons off the valence shells. And when they recombine, they give off packets of visual information that we can record. And so we can delve into just this object, which is very familiar. It's a beautiful object to observe, but there's so much more we can understand about it. Well, we ask a beautiful question, and then the answer leads to yet another actionable question. Uh, from Southern uh, Last Sphere, certainly the Winter Star Party or Chiefland, Florida, where I frequently uh, observe an image. Um, this on Taurus A, which is an incredible radio producer. Um, radio waves, and so it makes you ask questions. Well, it's an unusual form. You see this twisted core. So why? How did that happen? Why does it uh, produce so heavily in the uh, in the radio waves and the electromagnetic spectrum? And so a whole host of questions. And what other things do we have? This Thor's helmet, and it's got a very special star in there, um, uh, Ray, uh, Ray Wolf Ray star, and. You can ask a host of, of questions about those wolf rayet stars, which are supernova precursors, and they're very special. Uh, we've had a, read a couple of articles specifically on wolf rayets, and somebody, uh, I'll show you actually, I believe, their article in just a minute, where he used spectroscopy to study it. Uh, you, you have to wonder and ask questions. Why these wings? That bubble looks familiar to other ones. And then what other... Um, uh, objects also have a wolf ray star, like the uh, Crescent Nebula also has a wolf ray star. And what's the similarity? What are the differences as you compare these things? Well, this gentleman took it a step further and they used a low resolution spectral analysis to determine the terminal wind velocity of a wolf ray star. And this is with pretty um, and not extremely expensive equipment. So um, there's amazing things that you can do as an amateur astronomer to develop and ask um, additional, what we would call beautiful questions. And certainly he took the actions to uh, develop and increase his understanding and uh, change his, his understanding of his environment around him. And uh, this, uh, of course, is a uh, quasar, twin lens quasar. And if you've ever seen it, it's not something that uh, 
you you shout and go, wow, that was just an amazing thing. But when you understand what it is and it represents the uh, um, visual evidence of Einstein's second theory of relativity, it's 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 an amazing thing that that this massive foreground galaxy actually splits this light um, as it warps space and time. And those uh, those little dots of light arrive 317 days apart. It's just an uh, unbelievable thing. And it makes the hair stand up on your arms when you understand what it is. And so viewing any of these things and doing uh, some study and asking some questions can lead you into the deepest uh, uh, realms of physics and a greater understanding of all of that and a greater appreciation of everything that you see. So. Um, so sometimes I get people who say, well, you know, uh, I, I've seen everything that's worth seeing and uh, uh, and I've just become a little bored with the hobby. And I, I've reminded of my, what my grandmother, I know you, you, you can imagine what my grandmother would say about that. Uh, but they are, they're, they're not unintelligent. They are just probably a little bit uninspired. Um, but I think in our culture, and this is, gets to the the point that I want to make. Our culture has moved more and more towards a culture that is defined by amusement. And I mean, if you think of that word, um, muse is to think, and a is the, the, the prefix is without, um, is entertainment without thought. And I, I, I'm, I'm not a stick in the mud. There's a place for amusement, but I, I think it should not define our culture. It should not define somebody's life. Um, uh, with that thought. There's just too many fascinating things out there. And what my grandmother pushed us towards was a very different uh, perspective, one of questions and discovery. And I think our hobby is critical in directing people in that direction, particularly some young people. Um, yeah, we live in an age that's just an amazing incremental technology, but a diminishing sense of wonder and ability to think critically. And so even though I have a lot of uh, technology, frequently when I, I do outreach, I try and keep it to a telescope and an eyepiece um, because technology almost dulls their senses. Um, it is amazing. And I've done some outreach with, with uh, video cameras and I think it can be cool, but I try and get them away from a screen and a little bit more direct contact. And there's something about a photon hitting their eyeball that just seems to wake them up. And as much as they're wowed by some of this stuff, uh, uh, special effects, I tell you what, you still get oohs and ahs and wows when you show them a uh, high resolution um, image of, of the moon and an eyepiece or the rings of Saturn. And so, I, I, again, um, public outreach is extremely important. I know a number of you are in, engaged at it. Um, I, I think the, the biggest negative impact of the whole COVID uh, winter, as I call it, uh, was the fact that it's, it, it stifled a lot of the outreach. Certainly, I couldn't do the school outreach I used to do. And I, I think that's really a shame because I think it's absolutely critical um, to get people to start to think critically, to, to, to um, look up and see the, in, the incredible things that are, that are available to us. And so big fan of, uh, of uh, doing outreach. Um, I love the, and I love this, this cover. A um, friend of mine, um, Richard Wright, he does outreach at Starbucks. He likes the coffee, he goes there, works on his computer, does, does programming. Um, but he took this picture and sent it in for, for an article that he was doing. And I asked him, I said, gosh, that's a great picture. Did, did you set it up? I mean, did, did you get the people to point? But he goes, no, this is just what happened spontaneously. And, and he said, so as he's directing this young gal through the eyepiece, looking at, in this case, Saturn, um, he had shown the people in the background, that the gentleman there before, and he's pointing up to the lady what it is up in the sky that that uh, that bright looking star and her sun, and so he's passing on that knowledge, and that's part of that contagious thing. And what outreach does, you stoke stoke the uh, fire, you get people to look at things that they never that they just go around ignoring, and uh, so I love that cover for what everything that it represents. Um, so I, I again, prior to and hopefully get back to it, I do a lot of outreach. 
uh, go out with kids because I don't only reach the kids when you set up a school parking lot, um, the parents show up as well. And so you can have an incredible uh, impact. And again, I, I can't transport these kids down to those pitch black uh, skies that I saw in the Bahamas. Um, and I, I can't have the impact that uh, my grandmother had on me. Um, but you know what? I can show them the rings of Saturn. I can show them the moons going around Jupiter. I can show them um, some uh, high resolution uh, um, images of the, uh, of the moon and the craters. And I can get them to ask questions. And um, when you do that, it's extremely rewarding. And you get some that uh, really latch on, like this young lady who started uh, with me with one of my third grade outreaches. And the following year, she asked if she could help me set up the telescopes. Uh, the third year, she had her own telescope and she joined me and set up. By the fourth year, she was doing her own outreach events. And this young lady is now a, um, a junior at Caltech as a, as a physics major. So sometimes you can um, wander into somebody, uh, essentially a supernova, and who knows where this young lady will go. But it sometimes starts with a view of, uh, of the moon in a school parking lot. Um, and I'm not sure if this will run. I think it came unlinked when I lost, and I'm afraid I'm going to lose the whole thing. I can try and pull it up and see if it does. But this is, um, I got together with, uh, during a, uh, Mercury Transit, uh, with about seven people from my local club. And we did this outreach at the school. We passed out about a uh, thousand solar glasses. And I'm gonna try and launch this, so see if I don't screw everything up. And this is a time lapse of us setting up. And as you can see, we moved through a lot of kids. And we had a lot of demonstrations. We had a, um, a virtual solar system that was you know, uh, to scale. Um, Lonnie in the back there had a giant meteor. Um, we had different weighted buckets. You know, what would you, you know, what would, a, what would a pound weigh on this planet or that planet? We had a lot of scopes set up so they could see the uh, transit. And even though it was somewhat cloudy, a yeah, good thing about solar astronomy, <laughs> you can see through some of the lighter clouds. So we actually had a very successful event. Uh, but we moved through uh, a huge amount. And I, I can't tell you how many responses and uh, um, feedback from teachers and the kids I got from that one, you know, four hour. And again, it was exhausting, you know, um, uh, but we made an, an incredible impact on on some kids and some teachers and, you know, about four hours of our time. And all of us actually had a, had a great time doing it as well. So I encourage you all to uh, try and do some outreach. I'm back. OK. And uh, I also like to uh, uh, try and do different things to engage the kids. And so I'll have to do essay contests combined with uh, um, observing uh, projects. And one thing that you notice here, I mean, you know, the sciences I know used to be dominated by the guys. Now and I'm kind of worried about the guys because these were the finalists and they were picked blind by their essays and their observing reports um, by uh, five, five of my uh, subscribers who were involved in education. And as you can see, the young ladies pretty much dominated there. So we, we don't have that gap to uh, overcome. And uh, this young lady back in uh, um, what was it? 2015. She was relatively unknown, uh, and uh, uh, Pranvera is now uh, studying, I believe, at UCLA. Uh, but she has set the world on fire in the Republic of Kosovo, and does public outreach, and has got uh, got people to uh, uh, sponsor a bunch of telescopes and observatory over there, and everything else. So again, a young lady who just uh, really got involved in incredible things. The young lady behind me here, beside me here, is Julia Mariani. And she is now a dual major in astronomy and communications at uh, Brown University, and she wants to be the next Carl Sagan, and maybe she will be. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention in this talk some of the people who had a huge impact on me, the people who got me to ask beautiful questions, who, who led me to look up. Um, and these people have passed on at this point, but I, I, they had an incredible impact and it inspires me to try and do the same. 
Um, well, I'm sure many of you know Walter Scott Houston. He uh, wrote uh, Deep Sky Wonders for uh, Sky and Telescope. Uh, amazing individual. Carl, Carl Sagan probably is, nobody has ever had as big an impact on the general public. Um, to me, one of the best science and astronomy communicators that uh, has ever, ever lived. And uh, Cosmos was a huge uh, impact on me and, and probably millions of other people. Um, Clyde Tombaugh, interesting, started as an amateur astronomer and um, his, it, it, it lets you know what observations uh, can, where your amateur observation can lead you. Um, Billy Dodd, you probably don't know this gentleman, but he was the one who founded Chiefland Astronomy Club. And you may have somebody at your local club who, who uh, started the dark sky site or started up the club itself. Uh, but they're Billy in not great health at this point in the wheelchair in, in, in the middle of us. But uh, to this day, Chiefland is a vibrant um, astronomy community. And uh, he started all that by studying where the darkest skies, steadiest skies would be. And, and like I say, really started the ball rolling. So it made a big impact on a number of people. Uh, if you remember back, I, I was uh, lived in Miami. So Jeff, but Jack Horkheimer's uh, reach was far beyond that. Uh, Miami Plan Planetarium and his program Stargazer on uh, PBS. Um, Tom Johnson discovered folding optics made large, essentially long focal lengths um, affordable for uh, all, uh, you know, all amateurs and had a uh, profound impact so way on me as well. Uh, Tammy Plotner, you may or may not know her. She was an author, wrote for us and a number of other people, The Night Sky Companion, What's Up? And a very gracious lady. And even when she was struggling with serious health decline, she was just uh, engaged in her local uh, astronomy club and the star parties there and always met, made you feel like uh, family when you met her. Uh, John Dobson, our publication wouldn't exist without this gentleman. Um, uh, amazing and amazing for the outreach he did, not just the uh, simple uh, inexpensive telescope uh, design that he developed, uh, but his, uh, his sidewalk astronomy was had a profound influence on people. Uh, Don Parker, uh, planetary imager, personal friend, um, amazing planetary imager, but what some people don't know is Don started out um, sketching and his sketches were so accurate they have been used um, in scientific to establish uh, essentially changes on some of these planets, particularly on, on Mars. Um, so uh, Don Parker, amazing gentleman, had a, had a big impact as a personal friend as well. Uh, Barlow Bob, I think a lot of you know, uh, with the solar outreach at NEEF, um, terrific individual and had a, a, got a lot of people in, engaged in looking through solar telescopes. John Davis, who's uh, up, up in your neck of the woods, terrific individual, loved his writing. We, we've um, republished uh, a lot of his articles, finally have kind of run out. Uh, John was just a, a, a great guy, very gracious, always loved talking with him at, at length at, at Neef. Um, like I say, he just had a, an amazing way of writing um, his observing reports that made you want to go out and grab a telescope. And Tippy Dioria, founder of uh, Winter Star, Star Party. Um, again, another personal friend, an amazing observer as well. Um, Barbara Wilson, probably one of the, uh, the foremost um, female uh, observers and just an amazing observer. If you ever got the chance to observe with Barbara, she liked to go after those uh, faint fuzzies and extremely challenging uh, objects. But uh, just an, an amazing astronomer, and again, inspired lots, inspired lots of people around her. So, um, as you go forward, um, I, I mentioned those people because I hope that we can have, and we may not have the the impact of those people, but I think we can follow up with what they do and. Um, do our best to have an impact on others around us. Keep ourselves engaged, um, and then try and give back to the hobby and encourage the people around you that are maybe one step uh, further further behind you. Um, but I also like to uh, finish this up on a lighter note here um, with the uh, um, 10 commands for amateur astronomers. So 
Uh, first one is uh, very obvious. Thou have sh have sh uh, shalt have no white light before thee, behind thee, or to the side of thee, whilst sharing the night sky with thy fellow stargazers. Um, thou shalt not love thy telescope more than thy spouse or thy children, as much as maybe, but but not more. Uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's telescope unless it exceeds in aperture or electronics twice that of thy current kit. Thou shalt not read amateur astronomy or sky and telescope on company time, for that employer makes it possible to continue thine astronomical hobby. Thou shalt have at least two telescopes, so to keep your spouse interested with the same accompanies the under uh, dark night skies. Thou shalt not allow either thy sons or thy daughters to get married during the holy days of TSP, Okitech, uh, Starfest, or any other major or local star party. Thou shalt not reveal to thy spouse the true cost of thy telescope or imaging equipment, only the individual components, and that should be done with great infrequency. There's a lot, a lot of wisdom there. Thou shalt not uh, buy thy spouse any lenses, filters, dew shields, maps, charts, or any other necessities for Christmas, uh, anniversaries, or birthdays, unless thy spouse needs them for their own telescope. And thou shalt not deceive thy spouse into thinking that you are taking them on a romantic Saturday night drive when indeed thou art heading to a dark, site, uh, dark sky site. And thou shalt not store thy telescope in thy living room, dining room, or bedroom, unless they be sleeping with it full time. And finally, I've got a couple of addendums. Fairly observe or image not through thy neighbors AP or Arcos or Dob of Goliath, lest they be utterly consumed by the lust of apple fever, and thy brain and thy bank account shall shrivel and wither like flames, like branches in a flame. And thou shalt subscribe to Amateur Astronomy and record and contribute your observing notes and images on a regular basis so that others may be blessed by your knowledge and passion. So, most of all, in wrapping this up, um, again, I, I hope um, that if nothing else you take away from this, that you to continue to delve into and ask more beautiful questions is these uh, critical questions that get you to, to dig a little deeper. Um, I love, like anybody else, seeing the beautiful showpiece objects but I think it's important to engage a little bit beyond that, uh, engage our, our brains and ask beautiful questions and then take actions to discover the answers for ourselves through research and through practical means, whether imaging or observing. Um, pass on your enthusiasm for astronomy to others. Encourage them to ask beautiful questions. Again, um, don't just show them things, ask them and ask them, what do you think this is? Why do you think that's similar to this? Help that person who's a step or two behind you to advance to the next level. And uh, keep thinking, go out tonight or in the near future and discover something, truly discover something. Do some research, make your list, but see if you could discover something new or uh, a new, something new about what you've observed before. And uh, finally, Encourage you to invest in great resources and they have a special offer if anybody, some of you may, I, I know a number of you are subscribers, uh, but if you'd like a special, we're usually following a uh, presentation. Um, we're offering the, the complete 27 years of amateur astronomy and a thumb drive at issues that says one, 101, actually to 109, and a one year dual print and digital subscription for $100. So, um, if you uh, would like to take advantage of that, if you're an existing uh, subscriber, want to extend, and you want to get their complete history of our publishing history, um, you can take advantage of that. Or if you're new to new to us, you can do the same thing. All you would need to do on the website is go to the, it's actually the 25 years of amateur astronomy um, uh, on, on the website. And in the comments box, just put beautiful questions offer. And so it's normally like $185 um, uh, value for a hundred bucks for putting up with me and sitting through this long presentation and listen to me ramble on. So. Well, thank you, Charlie. That was really great. Uh, th thank you, Steve. And, and thank you to all of you. Really do appreciate uh, great spending time with you. Yeah, your, your club is 
one of those edible clubs that has withstood the, the test of time. So um, great stuff. Again, thank you very much for having me and uh, really do look forward to hopefully seeing you on, on a dark observing field or up at Neath in the near future.